Good afternoon, everyone. I think that we have a good set of people here in the audience that are waiting for today's lecture. So I wanted to welcome everyone to today's seminar. Um, my name is Ed Ray Goins, and I'm a professor here at Pomona College. Um, all of this is being broadcast over YouTube, and it's also going to be recorded. I'm the principal investigator here for an RU, Research Experience for Undergraduates, where this summer we're focusing on trying to get more information together about stories on Black mathematicians. So this is the first of a speaker series that we're going to have this summer that will invite in individuals who've done a lot of work to help preserve this history, or even work to research some of the stories that have been completely lost. So today, it's my great pleasure to introduce John Weaver, who is the CEO of Varsity Software. So I just wanted to say a little bit about um, Dr. Weaver, but before I do, let me say that um, for those that are interested, we will continue all summer. Our speaker next week will be Dr. Asamoah awesome Nkwanta, who is a professor of mathematics, actually department chair at Morgan State University. Uh, if you do have any questions about the webinar for today, please feel free to send any questions in the chat or even to put in any links. And we're going to go ahead and try our best to answer these questions at the end of the talk today. So please do stay around. John Weaver is an entrepreneur and a tech whiz behind the modernized version of the Mad Pages. In 2010, he founded Varsity Software, a consulting company that specializes in helping technology startups launch and grow software products. Before Varsity, he co-founded Reunion Technologies, a software platform to aid universities in fundraising. John has worked in the music industry as the Vice President of Information Technology at Time Warner's Electra Records, and also served as the VP and CEO at the national nonprofit Local Initiatives Support Corporation. Our RU Prime has been very lucky to have this expertise as we work on updating the map pages, and I'm sure that John will tell us in just a minute what those are, and we are very delighted to have him speak with all of us today. So, John, it's a great pleasure to have you. Thank you so much, Ed Ray, for having me today. The topic of my presentation is building scalable databases, my experience with the mathematicians of the African Diaspora website. And once again, my name is John Weaver. I'm the founder and CEO of Varsity Software, which is based in Princeton, New Jersey. So what I'm gonna do is actually just jump right into the presentation. And as Ed Ray mentioned, we're going to be using the chat function of Zoom. So if you have any questions, please put them into the chat. And in order to test everyone and make sure that you're awake, um, we're going to actually start the presentation with a question. Uh, so please use your chat. And my question is, what is this? Uh, if you can see my screen, there's a symbol on the screen. Um, please use the chat and tell me what this is. So I'll give you a few seconds to uh, <laughs> put information into the chat. Uh, the first response is a stack of pancakes. Sorry, that is not a stack of pancakes. Um, a three layer cake, that it is not. I've got answers, a cylinder, a stack of batteries, a silo, a stack of coins, a barrel. I've got some uh, pretty interesting answers in here, but uh, unfortunately most of those are wrong. And here we go, we have the right answer. It's coming from one of our attendees. This is a symbol for data. This is actually a database symbol. And whenever you see this, it usually means that there is a database somewhere. And since the topic of my presentation is building scalable databases, we're going to answer this question. What is a database? And let's start here with this definition from dictionary.com. A database is a comprehensive collection of related data organized for convenient access, generally in a computer. And I also would like to share another definition from Oxford Languages, which says that a database is a structured set of data held in a computer, especially one that is accessible in various ways. The common thread here is that a database is typically stored in a computer and it's really structured data, structured information that can be stored in a computer. Now, why is this important? Well, in order to understand why this is important, we've got to answer the next question about what is data? 
Uh, typically, uh, data, when you think about it, are individual facts, statistics, or items of information. Uh, that's according to the definition from dictionary.com. And when you think of data, it's really about individual pieces of information. So let's think about what information is in our society. And here's an example about information. Uh, hi, my name is John Weaver. I am married and I wear a size 10 shoe. Okay, I just given you a lot of information about me, but I haven't really given you data in a sense that a database would appreciate. A database would want to see examples of data like this. What's my first name? John. What's my last name? Weaver. What's my shoe size? 10. Am I married? True. A database is looking for information to be broken down into very discrete bits of data so that it can then use that for processing. And the data that can be stored in the database can be a string, like you see with first name, last name. Those are textual pieces of data. Shoe size, which is a number, 10. Or even a Boolean value, true or false, whether or not I am married. Why would you use this information in this format? Why do we use a database? So I'm going to ask everyone to go back to the chat and give me some answers. Why would we want to use a database where information is broken down into small pieces of discrete data? Go ahead and type into the chat why you think we might want to use a database. And let's see what kind of answers we get in the chat about why we would use a database. Okay, we've got some interesting answers here. Storage, easy access to specific information. Well, it's too hard to make sense of it if it's not organized. Organize and sort info, ability to sort information, ability to understand a population, makes information simple and clear, the ability to reference information quickly in a search. That's the one I want to focus on, the ability to reference information quickly in a search. And that is why I've got this little picture here with the guy and he's holding a magnifying glass. Typically, when you use a database, it's really to empower search so that you can search for information and make things easy to find. When you've got information that is stored in sentences and in paragraphs and in text, it's really, really difficult to search. And so you build a database to make things easy to search. And that has a direct impact on where we are with the MAD databases. So what is MAD? Um, MAD is a website, which was originally developed by Scott Williams, a professor at the University of Buffalo. And here is a screenshot from the original MAD pages. And Scott started developing these pages back in the early 2000s, in the early 2000s, and it was really a labor of love uh, for Scott. Every time he would meet a black mathematician, he would input their information into these web pages that he created. And he would put in any information that he could find about the mathematicians. And over time, these pages grew and grew and grew to what we call the MAD web pages. Here are some examples of profiles that existed on the MAD web pages. You can see on the left, we've got David Harold Blackwell, one of the most famous African American mathematicians. And this is what uh, Professor Blackwell's profile looked like on the MAD web pages. On the right, we've got uh, Dr. Salitha Washington's profile. And as you can see, what Scott would basically do is find out as much as he could about a person, find a picture if he could, and then he would post it into uh, the MAD web pages. Well, the way Scott did it is the way that a lot of people used HTML in the beginning um, of the web, and that is really just uh, adding text uh, about a particular entry. And so as you can see here with uh, Dr. Blackwell, you can see that he was born on April 24th, 1919. Uh, he was born in Illinois. You can see when and where he received his degrees from. And same thing with uh, Dr. Washington. But the takeaway is that when Scott built these web pages, everything was all in HTML. 
And for those of you who are not familiar with HTML, it's basically a markup language, a markup language which enables you to easily take information and make it available to a web browser. And with HTML, you have these tags. And as you can see here in this example, there's a P tag at the beginning of this sentence. Uh, the P stands for paragraph, and it enables a web browser to easily be able to read the text uh, that's in contained within the tag. And as you can see, there's a lot of good information in this tag about Dr. Blackwell. Uh, Dr. Blackwell is to mathematicians the most famous, perhaps greatest African-American mathematician. He earned his Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics in 1938, Master of Arts in Mathematics in 1939, and his PhD in 1941 at the age of 22 all from the University of Illinois. Now, there's a lot of information in this example, but there was really no easy way to take this information and turn it into data. And that was one of the challenges we had when we first started working on the MAD web pages, was how do you take all of this rich information that um, Dr. Scott Williams had uh, prepared over all these years and make it accessible in a database, primarily for search so that people could be able to search the information uh, that was stored on these web pages. So we embarked upon a project, um, and this project started probably in the uh, end of 2011, beginning of 2012, uh, to basically do an ETL process, extract load process, by which we could take the information from Scott's pages, extract that information, and transform it into a format that could be easily read by a database uh, and then load it into a database. So we spent about a year or two uh, going through this process of taking Scott's rich information uh, from his original set of MAD web pages and loading them into a database. And we launched what we called the MAD website version 2.0 in about 2012. And here you see a screenshot of the version 2.0 website. And on this website, what we did was we took all of Scott's information, all of the photos that he had accumulated, and we made it all into a database. Uh, by it being in a database, it means that all of the profiles could be accessible via search. And so here on this next slide, you can see what the original search page looked like for the MAD database. Uh, we had the ability to do a very basic search, uh, first name, last name, and keywords. And you could easily type in that information and get some results and see some profiles for people who matched those search terms. Um, and so the MAD pages that you see here were up online for about five years or so. We got a lot of great traffic. A lot of high school students, for example, would come to the MAD web pages to find out more about mathematicians. And we were really happy with the results. But over time, we started to realized that if we were going to grow this technology, grow this site, we needed to make a few changes. When we originally developed the site, we basically used Microsoft SQL Server in order to store the data that we took from Scott's original site. Uh, so now I'm going to ask another question. Please use the chat. Can someone tell me what SQL stands for, SQL? Um, what does SQL stand for in SQL Server? So go ahead and use the chat and tell me what SQL might stand for. Um, no idea. I like that. That's the first answer. Sequence query list, storage query language. No. Q equals query. Just a guess. And here we go. We have the correct response. SQL stands for Structured Query Language. And people ask, well, what is SQL? What is Structured Query Language? Well, it's basically a language that enables a program to talk to a database. Okay, so Structured Query Language, SQL, you might hear about that. Um, it basically enables a program to talk directly to a database. So you can have an HTML web page that can query a database using Structured Query Language and get a result set back. What does an SQL statement look like? Well, here you can see on my screen what an SQL select statement looks like. This is a typical select statement which enables you to fetch a record from a database. And with, with an SQL select statement, you can basically specify 
which data you'd like to return in your query. So you can see here, select column one and column two from a particular table. And you can also use conditions when you're doing an SQL statement. You can order the information so that it can be ordered by date or by timestamp or by first name or last name. And so SQL is a very powerful tool and language that enables you to query information from a database. And so with the uh, version 2.0 of the MAD web pages, we used SQL to enable our users to query the database and pull back uh, records uh, based on those original search conditions. But as I mentioned, as time went on, we started to realize some of the limitations around our SQL database, uh, some of which were related to cost. Uh, Microsoft, as I mentioned, we were using Microsoft SQL Server, and there's some costs associated with using a high-end database. There are some freeware uh, open source databases out there as well uh, that we looked at, but we determined and decided uh, about two or three years ago to actually move away from SQL and to move to NoSQL uh, for our next version of the platform. So from this slide, you can see some of the differences between SQL and what's now being called NoSQL in the programming world. And with NoSQL, you're not creating a database that's relational. It's basically a flat database structure. So there's no relations. It's typically a key and a value. And what that does is it gives you the ability to host massive amounts of data at scale. Uh, with the NoSQL database, you are able to store records and records and records in the system and not have to worry about running up against the limits of a database uh, in terms of storage space. And so we made the decision a couple of years ago to transition the new MAD pages to a NoSQL database. And we also made the decision to host it in Microsoft Azure. Uh, Microsoft Azure is a cloud-based service provided by Microsoft, similar to Google Cloud or Amazon Web Services, but with Microsoft Azure, it's all hosted within a Microsoft data center. And with Azure, it gives you the ability to lower your costs, uh, increase the scalability, and data storage can be really, really simple uh, with Azure. So we made a decision to move to a NoSQL environment on Azure about three years ago. And uh, this year, we are finalizing and finishing up the project. And that's what I'm going to be showing to you today. Um, on Azure, we also uh, looked at a number of different storage options for our data. As I mentioned, originally using SQL Server, uh, we had a relational database. But with Azure, we had the ability to move to Azure Table Storage, which enabled us to go to a NoSQL key value structure, which gives us the scalability that we are seeking as we grow out the MAD pages. Currently, we have about 750, almost 800 profiles in the database. Hopefully one day we'll have thousands of profiles in the database. And so therefore we were looking for a really scalable storage solution and Azure provided that for us. Additionally, Azure gives us integrated blob storage and what blobs are, they're basically unstructured files. So think of an image file or a picture, a JPEG or a PNG. You can store those blobs in Azure along with the table storage information so that everything is stored uh, in one data center. And so we made the decision to move everything uh, to Azure Storage. And this year, 2020, we will be launching the MAD website version three. So right now you see a quick screenshot of what uh, profiles will be available on the homepage. Uh, these are some examples of the profiles. And with the new MAD web pages, we will be able to do so much more than what we could do with the version 2.0 uh, web pages. Uh, and specifically, what the new pages will give us is the ability to do advanced search. Uh, this enables us to have multiple variables, multiple conditions, so that if a user wanted to see all of the female mathematicians uh, who went to Pomona College, uh, they could easily put in those search criteria and the database would return the value, uh, would return the results very quickly. If you wanted to see all of the deceased male mathematicians uh, who graduated in the year 1950, you could put in those criteria and the database would be able to return the values. Uh, and so the idea here is that we really wanted to empower search 
so that people could use the technology uh, in order to find results quickly and efficiently. Um, and it's basically a lot more powerful than the original site that Professor Williams did using basic static HTML. And the reason that it's more powerful is that we are now ready to scale. Uh, by moving to an unstructured um, database format using NoSQL, we are ready to scale up our platform. And for the last question to put into the chat, can someone tell me what this image is? What is this an image of that you see here on the screen? Uh, please use the chat window and give me some answers as to what this image is uh, that's showing up on the screen. And let's see what kind of responses we get. First response is a spiral. I've got a Fibonacci sequence. I've got an answer here about a spiral. Another person says a spiral, another spiral. And here we have the correct answer coming in. It's a fractal. Um, that's right. Uh, someone mentioned that this is a fractal. And uh, yes, it's a fractal. And the reason I chose this is because it kind of shows what scale can possibly look like as you move out to infinity. Um, as with all fractals, when you think about how they're formed, they can scale out to infinity and go beyond what you see in terms of your viewpoint. And that's what we're looking to do with our current MAD database, the version 3.0 uh, version, is how to scale it out so that we can have thousands and thousands and thousands of future profiles in the system. Uh, hopefully, as we roll this out, we'll get more and more people signed up to use the platform and we'll be able to be ready to scale as we grow. Uh, the limitations uh, that we've seen over the years will be eliminated because we're now using a scalable database structure. And hopefully as the platform reaches more and more people and becomes worldwide, we will have no problems at all putting more data into the system and giving people the ability to search that data on any criteria that they're looking for. So on that note, I'm going to open the session up for questions and happy searching as we roll out the MAD database version three later this year. So please use the chat window to, answer, to ask any questions that you might have for me and Ed Ray regarding scalable databases and the MAD website and web pages version three. Ed Ray, are you there? I think you're on mute, Ed Ray. I am. Um, yeah, thanks okay. very much, John. That that was a really fascinating, wonderful talk. Um, yeah, we should try to go ahead and go to some of the questions we're getting here. Um, Kevin Ega asked the first question, what's the URL going to be? Yes. So the URL is going to be www.mathad.com. So mathad, which is short for mathematicians of the African diaspora, dot com. Uh, if you go there now, we actually have disabled the 2.0 web pages because we're in the process of testing the 3.0 web pages. But the idea is later this summer, everything will be available on www.mathad.com. Mm -hmm. And I'm putting that here in the chat window, but I'm making sure to emphasize that it's not quite active yet. So if you go there, then it may not make any sense. Uh, we have another question here from Evelyn Lamb. Do you know when the new version will be available? Is there a beta version available now? Yes, so we are beta testing the uh, new site and I'll leave it up to Ed Ray to address the beta testing program and the stage that we're at. Um, and the idea is that we will be rolling it out to the public later this summer, early fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll say a little bit about that. I'm also gonna put the link to the beta here in the window as well. Uh, but just keep in mind that it's still under heavy testing. The hope is that we'll finish putting in um, a few more entries and work out the kinks over the next few months. But we're hoping, fingers crossed, that we will announce the new site at the Blackwell Taipia Conference that'll take place in October of this year. Um, we realize that it's still questionable whether the, the Blackwell Taipia Conference will run, but that's the plan right now to at least unveil it in October, in the fall. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we have another question here uh, from Amy Oden. Clinton Washington the third asked, um, how were you able to work in the music industry, music and technology industries? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, that's an interesting story. I'll, I'll give you a quick synopsis. Um, I actually grew up in the Bronx, New York during the 80s, uh, in the beginning of the hip hop era. And when I got to college, I basically started a DJ company and I wanted to be a DJ. Uh, hip hop was everywhere at the time. But being a product of an IBMer's son, uh, my father worked at IBM for 30 years. I remember getting a, a computer back when I was 12 and just tinkering and playing so that when I got to college as well, so not only was I DJing, but I was also uh, installing network cards on people's computers uh, as we were building out the first local area network at our college. So I was always interested in music and technology. And when I graduated, uh, I actually started working for a software development company. Um, and uh, that was an interesting role because I was able to develop a lot of multimedia projects. Um, but then I got a call one day from one of my college friends who worked at Time Warner. She said, you know, there's a wonderful opportunity opening up here at Electra Records. They're looking for someone who loves music and knows technology. And I thought of you. And that was the beginning of uh, my music career. And I basically worked as a VP of information technology at Time Warner's Electra Records. At the time, uh, Time Warner owned Warner Music Group, which included Electra Records, Warner Brothers Records, and Atlantic Records. So I was a member of the steering committee uh, for all three labels. And what we faced at the time, this was in the mid 90s, was the rise of CDs and the distribution of music uh, via CD. And then as the internet started coming out, uh, people started sharing music and a tool was released called Napster. And I was there at Time Warner as we struggled with how to handle Napster. And so I was able to witness the music industry going up as well as come down as people started sharing music and stopped purchasing CDs. And it was a very, very interesting time. Learned a lot uh, for the number of years that I was uh, at Time Warner and worked in the music industry. Fast forward a couple of years and I ended up going back to business school and uh, becoming an entrepreneur after graduating from business school and starting a technology company, but still heavily interested in music and still DJing. In fact, I DJed a virtual party about two weeks ago with uh, some of my friends uh, using using Zoom and Twitch. So still heavily involved in the music scene and the technology scene as well. You know, I actually want to ask you a follow-up question, so I'm, I'm curious now. Do you, you have any um, thoughts about DJing now versus, say, DJing in the 90s or so? Absolutely. I mean, I think when we started DJing back in the 90s, it was much more of a manual process. We had to carry crates of vinyl records to our parties. We had to carry our heavy 1,200 turntables, uh, mixers, lights. Nowadays, we go with a laptop and a controller. Um, all of the music is literally stored on a hard drive. You can have instant requests. Someone asks for a song. You don't have to dig through your crates and look for a piece of vinyl that you might not have, that you may have left at home. You can easily fulfill people's requests now. So it's a lot easier to uh, actually spin music. Uh, it's also a lot easier to learn. Uh, a lot of the technology and the software makes it easier for people to actually go out and DJ now. So um, I've seen the evolution. Uh, my daughter is starting to DJ, so I, I love it. You know, it's in the blood of my family. So yeah, it, it, I've definitely seen the evolution of DJing from the 80s and 90s to today. Okay, yeah. yeah this is something that I need to talk to you more about offline because I, I really am interested in this whole thing. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> someone who asked here slightly more technical questions, let me ask this. Nevin Eder um, asked, can you explain why no SQL allows for more advanced searches than SQL? Sure, sure. So let me start by just talking a little bit about SQL and relational databases. Um, when you're creating tables within SQL, you basically have to have a structured data format. So you set up your table, you set up your columns in anticipation of what kind of data you're going to be expecting uh, that your platform is going to receive. So, for example, if you are creating a form that collects, uh, let's say, first name, last name, phone number, and email, then typically in a SQL database, you would create a table. It would have four columns, first name, last name, phone number, and email. Uh, let's say your application grows, and a year from now or two years from now, you find out you don't just want to collect email addresses. You want to collect uh, phone um, 
let's say a business email address. Uh, now in SQL, you would have to actually update that table and add another column. And then all of your searches would have to reference that new column in the table. Uh, by moving to NoSQL, we were able to sidestep a lot of those issues as our database uh, structure grows. So that was one of the reasons we decided to move away from SQL to NoSQL. Another reason was cost. Um, typically, when you're storing data in a SQL database, uh, especially with a, a platform like Microsoft SQL Server, you're buying space on a SQL Server based on how much data you're going to store. So you're buying one gigabyte of storage or five gigabytes of storage space, and then Microsoft will charge you for that storage space. Um, and that storage space is more expensive than a flat table structure like using uh, key value pairs with NoSQL. And so that's another reason that we decided to move the version three to a NoSQL structure. So to follow up with that, you mentioned that um, you're using Microsoft Azure. Do you have to worry at all about things like space or where physically it's stored? Are there extra costs that are associated to that to worry about? Sure. So Microsoft Azure has data centers around the world, um, and you can basically choose where your data is stored. So mm -hmm. if there are security issues, um, if you're a U.S.-based company, for example, you only want your data stored in the U.S., you can specify that. Uh, but most importantly, they've got backup capabilities and disaster recovery capabilities. So if something were to happen to one data center and you wanted your data to be redundantly available at another data center, you can easily set it up so that your data can be stored in any of those Microsoft Azure data centers. So that's a very useful feature of Azure. And Amazon has the same functionality. Uh, Google has the same functionality. And when you think about hosted infrastructure, a platform as a service, those are the big three, Microsoft, Amazon, Amazon and Google. I see. So there's another question that we have here that's also along the lines of being technical. Jayla Langford asks, why did your team originally choose to use the Microsoft SQL Server instead of another programming language? Sure. So when we first started the project, we did look at other databases um, like MySQL, which is an open source database that doesn't have uh, the cost associated that uh, come along with my, uh, SQL Server from Microsoft. However, given the expertise of our team at the time, this was in the early 2010s, we had actually developed the programming code in Microsoft ASP.NET using C Sharp. And so we wanted to stick with the Microsoft family of services and products, which is why we chose Microsoft SQL Server. So it's primarily driven because the code was written in C Sharp. I see. Okay. Uh, let's see. It's another question here in a slightly different direction. Um, Malik Kanta asks, when do you believe that the MAP website will reach its prime, especially being that not as many people are aware of the purpose and the cause of this? Sure, sure. And actually, I'm going to turn that question to you, Ed Ray, because I think it has something to do with policy and and the issue around exposure for black mathematicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it, it, it is it, it's a difficult thing to kind of know how do you advertise something like this, because I think that there are some websites out there that did a really good job of over the years making themselves known, like mathematically gifted and black. I think is one of, one of the best known ones. That does feature biographies of mathematicians, photos. You know, every year it's made a point that when Black History Month comes along, people are featured in Mathematically Gifted and Black. A lot of emails, tweets go out to, to kind of announce it. But I think now there's enough momentum that people know about it and they expect it to come out every year. Um, also, I think that the American Mathematical Society, this is a big professional organization, has done a really good job of having posters, that do feature some of these mathematicians, and it works very much hand in hand in mathematically gifted and black and getting more of that information out there. I think when Scott Williams first invented the Mad Pages back, you know, 20 years ago, that he really did this as a labor of love, but because there was nothing else out there like this, slowly the word got out that this is the place you would go if you even wanted to know any black mathematicians at all. I can tell you when I went to grad school in 1994, I didn't know a single one. So just knowing that the site was out there, you know, just being able to go to the site, click on it, find at least one name, that, that was a pretty serious thing. Nowadays, I think we have more, more options, maybe more distractions that, that are kind of keeping us from really getting the word out that, that we're going to exist. And we probably have to be a little bit careful about that. 
you have um, this Mac Tutor site that's out in Scotland, this Mac Tutor um, Archives in the History of Mathematics that features over 3,000 mathematicians. But I believe that they maybe have five black mathematicians out of those 3,000. So I think that that's a site where a lot of people know about biographies, but they probably don't know about biographies of black mathematicians. So, you know, we'll have to find a way to kind of just get the word out there. I, I am thinking that it'll certainly be good to focus on social media, so Twitter and what have you. Um, but the hope is, I think, going to be twofold. One, to let people know that it exists so that more people can kind of go to the site to learn about black mathematicians. But the second is getting the word out to black mathematicians that, hey, we want your biographies. We want more people to be added into the site to do exactly what you're saying so that we can scale up. We're at 712 now, but if we let, we'd be really happy if, say, you know, years from now, we're at 7,000, 70,000 people that are here in the site. Absolutely. And I'm actually going to just go back to the first slide for a moment here and just leave this up uh, for the duration of our conversation, because one of the things we built into the new technology is an API. So we now have the ability for taking the data that's in our database and making it available to any other site out there that wants to feature black mathematicians. So these profiles that we have in the MAD website can be embedded onto any other website that's out there. Uh, we have a RESTful API, so if they want to tie directly into uh, search capabilities, they can do that as well. So that was part of the reason that we moved away from uh, the version one and two to this new version this year, so that we could do a lot more of that functionality and hopefully be able to grow the, the scale and the impact that the site will have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, thanks. So there's a lot of questions here. Let me try to go through these a little bit more. Alexis Kelly asks, what made you want to work on this particular project? Um, what made me want to work on this project? I will tell you that I attended a CARMS conference. Uh, and for those and of what, you what is CARMS for the people who are not familiar, yeah, CARMS is the conference on African American researchers in mathematical sciences. It was started by Professor Bill Massey, uh, who's actually here in this image in the middle. And Professor Massey started CARMS about 22, 23 years ago. I, I want to be careful, it might be 25. So I think 20, he technically celebrated 25 last year. Yeah, okay, you're right. So, and basically every year, um, Professor Massey partners with the university to host students to present posters as well as current researchers in the mathematical sciences to get together uh, and collaborate, uh, think, strategize, and it's usually a three-day conference. And so I went to my first comms conference probably in 2010, and Professor Scott Williams was one of the attendees, and I remember having lunch with uh, Professor Williams, and he told me about the Mad Pages, and, and Bill is just, uh, Professor Massey, he's, he's just a networker and connector. So he was like, uh, you know, Mr. Weaver, you're a tech guy, and Professor Williams, you're uh, into these profiles. You guys need to just sit and have lunch and talk about it. And it was just interesting to me, and that's how the collaboration began. And so CARMS has always been one of those events that I try to attend every year. Uh, in order to meet people and find out what projects are going on. This year, it did not happen because of COVID, uh, but it's usually held in June slash July of every year. Mm -hmm. Right, and let, let me just add maybe for the people out here watching and listening, um, John is actually being very, um, um, very kind to himself. He actually is one of the, the people who started the, or I should really say put together and designed the CARMS website. And I know I look forward to it every year. There's wonderful pictures up there, kind of as a good, place to find the history of, of CARMS itself. Thank you. Um, yeah. Let me move on to the next question. This is from Janice Oldham. My question is about the content of the pages, not on the database and the issues connected with it. My profile had errors in the dates, and I'm sure that other people would say the same thing. I told Scott about it, but he could not correct it. Um, are the errors in the content of the profiles correctable now? Great question. So right now what we're doing is we're going through an editorial process where we're correcting the obvious problems uh, that we're noticing in some of the content. Because some of Scott's content is old at this point. It's 2020. He might have entered it in 2008 or 2007. Um, so we're going through and just correcting some of that content. But the idea is that everyone who has a profile in the database will be able to edit their own information. 
similar to Wikipedia. So once we launch and go live, we will be providing everyone who has a profile with the ability to log in and be responsible for managing their own data. That way, if there are any problems or errors, you'll be able to go in and um, update that information yourself. That was also one of the reasons we took down the existing site um, because there were so many errors there that we just wanted to, you know, just take it down, work on just the beta version before we launch it to the public so that we could correct a lot of that old information. I won't say bad information, but just old information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll add a couple more things to that. Um, and I'll say that if there are people out there that really do want their information corrected, and I know that there's a lot of people that do, um, certainly send me an email for one because we have the team of undergraduates this summer that's going to do line by line to make sure that all 712 entries are correct, that they are getting updated. Um, in terms of what's currently out there for Scott Williams' old pages, my understanding is that Scott hasn't touched those pages since 2008. And in theory, a Buffalo could take them down any day. I, I know right. Scott has been saying that for the last 10 years. So we have no idea when or if they're going to disappear. But we are hoping that the updated version you know, will, will be out in the next few months. Right. So. And I don't think Scott has the ability to change any of the current Buffalo pages because that tool is no longer available. And so that's why there might be old information on Scott's original pages and Buffalo might take it down at any point. So that's why we're working furiously to get the new site up and running. Right, exactly. I um, have a question here from Evelyn Lamb who asks, are you looking for feedback on the beta version at this time? And if so, how should people send that in? Absolutely. So we're currently always looking for feedback on a couple of fronts. Um, one, style, uh, the way things look, whether or not things are broken. Uh, if you see a link that doesn't work or there's a picture that's a low quality and it needs to be changed. Um, so we're definitely looking for feedback. Right now, Ed Ray and I are probably the best people to reach out to uh, for feedback. I will provide my email in the chat. So if you can look at the chat, you'll have my direct email. And if you have any ideas, suggestions, comments, thoughts, please feel free to drop me an email and I'll get back to you directly. Yeah. There's another question from Jasmine James. Uh, what were some of the biggest challenges you faced while becoming a professional slash entrepreneur, and how did you overcome these challenges? Um, as a follow up, even more, is there any advice you would give to your younger self today? Yes, that's a great wow. question. Um, the advice I would give to my younger self today would be to find an older mentor quicker. I would say that it probably took me 10, 15 years before I found a group of folks who I could truly call mentors. And I struggled in the beginning trying to just manage my career on my own. And as an African-American um, uh, technologist in the 90s, I graduated in 1992, um, there were not a lot of people who looked like me in the field. Uh, my daughter is always amazed when I tell her I graduated, when I graduated, there was no internet. Uh, just, there just was no internet that people are familiar with like today. So I couldn't just go out there and, and Google someone and try to find, uh, you know, a black technologist. Uh, email was just becoming a thing. Uh, not everyone had email addresses even back then. Um, so today, it's a lot easier to find a mentor. It's a lot easier to reach out to someone and say, you know, I'm a student or I've recently graduated. I'm interested in this topic or this field. Can you give me some insights? So, you know, I would definitely recommend, you know, finding someone. And that's to the purpose of what this database eventually should be is a resource. So if you're looking for someone in the, in the field of mathematics who works in a specific area or who has an interest that's similar to yours, you should be able to reach out to that person and hopefully find a mentor. So I, I want to ask a question to follow up about that. Um, I believe that the numbers show that even though the number of African Americans getting PhDs in mathematics is very small, the numbers are even worse in computer science. Um, right. Do you have any thoughts about, let's say, nowadays, the number of African Americans that are in the tech industry, the numbers that are there in Silicon Valley? Just any thoughts either way. Yeah, absolutely. So it's growing. Um, it's definitely growing. And there are a number of projects uh, as well as initiatives to make that number larger. Uh, in fact, I just saw something today where Silicon Valley companies are spending a lot of more money, especially due to the recent protest, 
um, to try to increase the diversity at a lot of the big tech companies. But I'll be honest, when I was younger, there was almost no presence, um, especially when you look at you know, the larger tech companies. Um, I actually got my undergraduate degree in anthropology. I decided at the time, you know, there were no mentors, there was no one who looked like me in computer science. You know, I got my degree in anthropology and still went right to work after graduation at a software startup, right? So it, it doesn't necessarily matter what you study, it's about what you really want to do. And then finding someone who can help you do that and getting involved with a team of people or a group of people who can help further your career. You know, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that. It's actually, there was a question here I was just going to read next. Um, it's from Ramoy Hammond. It says, um, I had researched you briefly, and I noticed that you studied anthropology as an undergraduate. What mm -hmm. led you to make this deviation to what you do now? Was it always <laughs> your intention? Uh, that, that's a great question. So I will tell you, when I was an undergraduate student, I took an anthropology course with the best professor I've ever met in my life and totally changed my orientation to how to approach problems. Uh, previously, I was very technically oriented and, you know, I would think about a problem a certain way. But this professor in this course I took showed me that anthropology gave me a certain lens for analyzing problems. And I ended up focusing uh, my anthropological studies as an undergrad on black males. Uh, I wrote my thesis on African-American males and com how we kill each other at a higher rate than other populations. Mm -hmm. And I ended up winning the Departmental Thesis Award because at the time, this movie Boys in the Hood had just come out. And I used that as an anthropological study to look how we compared to a tribe in Brazil, uh, in Venezuela, called the Anamamo Indians, and you know, trying to understand how violence amongst African American males uh, has evolved and where it's headed. Um, and then, you know, thinking about anthropology as a as a tool and technology as a tool, uh, that was how I blended my anthropological background um, with my passion and and knowledge of technology and computer science. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, great. That, that is really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, I'm going to try to answer or get to a few more questions here in the 10 minutes or so we have left. This question is from YouTube, uh, from YouTube chat. Someone named Essie Cass asked the question, if I want to start up a similar website, say about indigenous mathematicians, what would you recommend? Um, to add some content, suppose just hypothetically that I don't know anything about databases and I'm just a random pure mathematician. Sure. So first thing I would recommend is partnering with a technologist, um, someone who can help you understand the data you want to collect, because there are two approaches you could take. One is you could do exactly what Scott did 25 years ago, which is uh, use a blog or any of the content platforms out there to post the content uh, that you find about the indigenous mathematicians. And you can get the information out there, but you're gonna run into limitations, similar to Scott, about how that information can be utilized. Uh, can it be searched? Uh, can you run reports on it? Can you use it for um, recruiting people into the field? Um, so that's one path you can take, but based on our experiences over the years, I would strongly recommend just trying to find a technologist to work with who can help you define the content you're trying to collect and put it into the right platform and tool. Uh, there are plenty of off-the-shelf platforms now that are available that you could probably spin something up pretty quickly. Um, but you know, I would suggest working with somebody who's technologically uh, fluent who could provide that kind of guidance. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that is really great advice. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I have another question here from Clinton Washington III, who asks, what's the best way to get coding experience if you are not a computer science major? Ah, great question. So coding experience is, it's a difficult question to answer because there's a lot of different languages you can code in, right? So typically if you are a computer science major, depending on the school you go to, they're gonna teach you some fundamentals about uh, technology and programming. So you're gonna learn C, you're gonna learn possibly Java, you're gonna learn some really fundamental stuff um, about technology uh, and programming. But if you look at the internet today and you look at where we've evolved to, 
there's a plethora of, of languages and tools and technologies and more and more are being created every day. Uh, you can literally sign up for uh, a coding boot camp and uh, learn JavaScript or learn Python um, and spend you know a couple of weeks just learning how to do something specific in a, in a certain language. So I would, I would challenge you to answer the question by asking a separate question. What are you trying to do? What are you actually trying to do with your programming skills? Uh, and then finding a language or a technology that can help you achieve that quickly. Um, if you want to be a computer scientist and you want to learn uh, how to program um, a machine language and learn how to, you know, all the ins and outs of C, then absolutely a computer science degree will help you do that. But if you're just trying to build a website and you're trying to have a couple of HTML pages with some data on the back end and you want to use JavaScript to do that, you could probably more quickly sign up for one of these camps, one of these boot camps, and learn that fast. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Let's see. I think we have one last question here. So I'll add this and maybe we'll um, end here. Um, <clears throat> so I'll ask two questions here. Um, this is from Jonathan Fair and it asks, what do you spend most of your time doing as a founder and CEO of Varsity Software? Got it. So I would say networking. Um, the job of any leader is to network, 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 and find talent uh, because you never know what projects are going to be out there and what kind of support uh, is needed for those projects. So I would literally say I spend 50% of my day talking to people uh, before COVID, actually attending conferences, uh, going to uh, schools, attending uh, pitch meetings, and uh, going to demo days, and just networking and meeting people. Um, and then the other 50% actually getting some work done, doing some programming. I'm a night owl, so I will be up late at night working on code and learning. Uh, I would say that I spend a, a lot of time learning new things. Uh, technology constantly is changing. Apple, for example, is always releasing new software for their iPhones and iOS is always being updated and there's always new stuff to learn. So, you know, I, I would say between networking, finding opportunities, generating new business and just learning and programming is how I spend my time. Right. Do you think that the networking world is, is changing significantly now that we're, you know, post COVID-19, meaning that it may not be the case where we can actually physically talk to people at conferences, but you do have like these Zoom meetings, you are able to contact people over LinkedIn. Like, how do you think that the world is going to change now in terms of networking? I am more busy now, Ed Ray, than I was before COVID. <laughs> and I think it's because people are starting to realize the power of technology. Hey, I don't have to go to New York City or Houston or San Francisco. I can set up a Zoom conference and get people together. So I think that has now sunk in with a lot of folks that you can network, you can get people together on a call, on a video chat a lot easier. And so my calendar gets booked a lot quicker now than if I did have to jump on a plane or jump on a train and go to an event. And you can only attend one event on one weekend. You know, now you've got three or four invitations for the same day and there's just so much more happening. The question is, in the fall and next year, once the restrictions and quarantines lift, will people start traveling again and will uh, people stop with the virtual? I think there'll be a mix. I think uh, there'll be a period of time in which folks will be not too comfortable with traveling and we'll see uh, a lot of virtual stuff continue to happen. So I'm based here in New Jersey and uh, New Jersey and New York were hit pretty bad. I in fact had COVID along with my wife and my mother and survived. So, you know, I think as people understand the impact of, of this disease and the pandemic, uh, they'll get a better, we'll see in the next couple of months what their comfort level will be in terms of traveling. But I would say now that folks are quarantined still, you're still at home, attend as many events as you can, network as much as you can, you know, this is the opportunity to do that. Right, right, definitely. Well, I can say on a personal level, I'm really happy that you're feeling much better after you catch the virus. Yeah, from the yeah. Um, let's maybe have one last question and then we could try to wrap it up. This is from Rachel Karpman. And the question is, how is this project funded? 
can the math community either contribute or support? Yes. So, um, Every, I'll let you answer that, actually, because you've been a wonderful source for sponsoring this project and getting it to where it is today. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess I definitely need to say that we've had um, several people that, that have really put up money for this to help out. I mean, of course, Scott Williams put up his love, financial support, you know, what have you. He really did an incredible amount of work. And we wouldn't even be having this conversation if it wasn't for Scott putting all of this together. So I personally am very indebted to Scott, you know, for helping with the community for helping all of this. And I really view a lot of the work that we're doing here as our way of really saying to Scott, thank you for helping put the community together. Um, also, I personally have to thank the Educational Advancement Foundation because they have put up a lot of their own money to do this. And in particular, the CEO of EABF, um, Harry Lucas, has been personally very invested in making sure all of this works. Uh, the Chief Financial Officer, Albert Lewis, has also been very, very dedicated to this. So I, I have to say publicly to the two of them that they have put up a lot of money to help out with this. Um, I've also used money, as you see here on the screen, from Pomona College and from the National Science Foundation to do a lot of things. You know, I, I guess in terms of more support, this could either be financially or just morally from the math community. I don't really know if we've talked about it very much, kind of how we can really get people more involved. I guess that's something that, that we should probably think about. You know, now that I think that there's a lot of interest that people just wanting to help get the word out, wanting to maybe even put up a little bit of money. But I mean, money always helps, you know, no matter what. Money is always going to be a good thing. So I suppose that people have to kind of, you know, maybe wait until we start to announce the website so we can start to really put out there how people might be able to help out some more. Yeah, yeah let's see. So I don't see any other questions here in the chat window. I think that we've gone through all of the big ones that, that come up. So um, yeah, I think that we've hit thank right you. exactly at the two o'clock hour. So so John, thank you very much. It's, been, it's really been a really informative talk. I really enjoyed the conversation. Well, that thank we you, Ed Ray, for having me and good luck with the future conversations over the next couple of weeks. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. And before we uh, sign off, I wanted to personally thank Amy Oden. I don't know if Amy at least wants to show her face for a little bit. Um, she is my assistant here at Pomona College. She's been doing an incredible amount of work getting everything done. So hello there, Amy. So I wanted to firstly thank you very much for all the work that you've been doing here, getting all of this to, to come together. Thank you so much, Adre. I appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to say to everyone, I just put in the chat a link um, and it has a list of speakers who will be having um, in the coming weeks. And we're really looking forward to it. Um, I know Next Tuesday, we're having um, Dr. Asamo and Kwanza speaking. So I hope to see y'all there. Great. Okay. Take care, everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye bye.